Thank you, and, and thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to, to talk. I mean, it would be better, of course, to talk at CIRM, but um, I hope next time. <laughs> So uh, I also apologize for you, uh, those of you who have already seen that talk in a more uh, in a more detailed version. But uh, since there were plenty of participants who had not, I thought this was still a good idea. Um, so what I want to uh, very briefly present is um, a, a recent result with uh, Didier Brèche and then my former student about the mean field limit for um, attractive singular gradient flow. And in particular, the, the big application in mind there is, is keller -Zegel. Um So let me go through a brief introduction. As, as you know, there's now a lot of applications and settings where we use uh, many particle system or multi-agent systems. Uh, so this is just a sort of a list uh, of, of some of those, right? And as I said, what I'm mostly going to focus on today are, is the example of chemotaxis, the classical example of chemotaxis due to keller -Zegel. Um So in general, right, you can have a wide range of what we call particles from, uh, so this is galaxy simulations. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you know, very large to very small, those are neurons, so very, very small, and biology instead of physics. Um, to jump right into the equations that I'm, I'm going to consider today, uh, this is the, the typical system. Um, so we consider uh, capital N particles, uh, identical or undistinguishable, meaning that the system itself will be exchangeable. So if you look at this equation and I do any, um, yeah, so you observe that this equation, if I do a permutation of the indices, then I, I still have the same system. So this is the big consequence of having those identical particles. Uh, and here, I'm, I'm going to follow uh, some vector associated with this uh, uh, each particle. So let's call it xi. I'm going to take it on the torus for simplicity. Uh, it would be okay in any bounded domain, um, but there are issues with the whole space that I won't be discussing. And it's a very typical system that, that we consider here. So there's the evolution of the position of the particle is due to a sum of two by two interactions plus some diffusion. Uh, now, the key thing, of course, in the two by two interactions is that I rescale them with this one over n and red, right? So that at least formally speaking, uh, the, the, the interaction is of order one. And this is what people call the mean field scaling. The noise is due to uh, an independent Brownian motion, and I'm taking a constant viscosity here, or diffusion coefficient. Um, we could actually take a diffusion coefficient that depends on n, for example, um, and most of what I'm going to say would remain correct, uh, even though if you the big example there is in particular sigma of order one over n. Uh, because this is connected to some important scaling in Coulomb gases. And if you do that, uh, or any sigma that degenerates with n, you would have to update the, the, the main theorem that I'm going to show later. And of course, the big thing that I'm trying to do here is I am trying to uh, derive the mean field limit for this system. So I'm trying to derive a continuous, um, continuous PDE um, at the limit n tends to infinity, and if possible, I would like to do that in a quantitative, in quantitative manner, meaning I would like to have quantitative estimates telling me how close the discrete system is to the continuous limit. Um, so this is very um, old uh, questions that, that has been uh, much studied, uh, of course. So I'm only giving here a very, very brief overview of, of some of the 
some of the recent results um, in as, I mean, if you've seen one talk on mean field you're uh, you're familiar with the fact that the big uh, difference between all results is how much regularity you're going to assume on the, the interaction kernel k and classical results in that case are Lipschitz and this is where the first uh, mean field limits were, were obtained, both in the deterministic and the stochastic case, right? Deterministic is uh, things like Gaussian, Brown and Hepp, and that's the 70s. And stochastic, I'll discuss on the next slide. Uh, but the Lipschitz case is still used very much to understand the structure of, of, uh, of the mean field limit uh, in general. Um, Closer to what I'm going to discuss today are the derivation for 2D order and, and most importantly, a recent method to handle risk kernels that, that was introduced by uh, Sylvia Serpati and, and one of her students, uh, Misia Durings. But of course, in the deterministic setting, there are many other interesting results. Um, I just want to briefly mention that a second order system, so when instead of having x, you have x and the velocity, so uh, it's posed in the phase space. Those are um, much less well understood uh, in spite of some, um, some improvements, some, some recent results. And, and of course, if you go into collisional models or things like that, I mean, this is much more complicated. Um, now, interestingly, the stochastic setting, so with diffusion, is actually a lot less well understood than the deterministic case. And there are still more reference than, than what I'm including here, uh, so this is uh, only a brief summary. But it turns out that in particular, if you want to use trajectorial method, and even though, um, you know, me being an analyst, I'm thinking of diffusion as something that helps, but having Brownian motions here, if you're going to consider the trajectories of each particle, is actually quite complex. And for example, typically the K that I'm going to consider will have a singularity near the origin, and Brownian motions will bring you near the origin almost surely. So this actually forces the singularity to show up in some manner. And so it turns out that they are quite a bit more complicated. So the, the 2D Navier-Stokes, for instance, which corresponds to 2D compressible order, uh, we had preliminary result by Zada with a smallness condition, but uh, the first derivation without smallness condition is much more recent and was due to, to uh, Fournier and Michel. Of direct interest to me, if you look at the keller zegel system, which I'm going to write in the next slide, um, they are not um, any strong results so far. So there have been various attempts which were more or less successful to some extent. Um, Essentially, I, I think the most successful one was a, a recent paper by Fourney and Jordan, uh, which proved some infill limits and some scaling that, again, I'm going to explain, but they don't get the, the propagation of chaos. And the big problem is, of course, the attractive singularity here. So the, the repulsive keller zegel is much better, uh, much better understood. So this is, uh, let's write down this system. So the logic here is uh, very simple and it's pretty much a toy model from a biological point of view, but it gives you a, a, a good idea of the type of scaling and the type of singularity that you should have in this kind of model. So to, to take something very, very simple again, uh, if you just assume that the position of, of the particle um, follow the gradient of the concentration of some chemical. Okay, so let's call C of T and X the concentration. 
Then we end up with uh, a very uh, simple stochastic differential equation on, on each xi, which is the one written here. Um, and again, I'm adding noise. Now, the big thing here to get something that is interesting is, of course, that the concentration C itself depends on the distribution of the, the, the particles. And here I'm considering um, um, what in the end will be a um, um, parabolic elliptic keller zegel system. So I'm assuming that the speed of diffusion of the concentration is much faster than the uh, speed of the particles. And what that means is that I can essentially assume that the uh, concentration reaches an equilibrium given the distribution of the particle. So it's going to solve the Poisson equation with a source. And this is where the, the, the feedback appears in, in the dynamics. I'm assuming that each microorganism itself is capable of producing the chemical. So in this source term for the concentration CI, I have this sum of Dirac masses centered at the uh, organism. And of course, you could also include uh, external sources, right? So the one that is of interest to me that presents the difficulty for the derivation is, of course, this sum of the arc masses. And, you know, I can immediately use, if I'm in dimension two, I'm going to use, the, the of course, uh, the explicit solution for the Poisson equation. So I get this formula for C, and if I put this into the dynamics, I get a system which has exactly the expression that I had before, and that is the one that you see there. Right. And in all that, there is this very important parameter lambda, which compares the strength of this attraction with respect to the strength of the diffusion at a sigma. So again, this is pretty much a toy model. Um, so if we were dealing with a realistic biological system, uh, we would have certainly, we should have more complicated expression. So it's sort of important whenever we are going to use, uh, to, to derive something for the system that the theorem we have are more broadly applicable than just this particular interaction. But in terms of singularity, for example, so the fact that the uh, singularity here is something that is attractive, and as you can see, that is in one other distance between the two particles, right? That gives the right scale. If I'm um, playing the uh, mean field limit for this, I get the corresponding padlock keller zegel system, uh, which, uh, so Patlack had the first paper in 53, but didn't write exactly the, the, the equation. And then Keller and Zegel went back to it in, in, in uh, 1970 and, and wrote the system under the, the, the present form. And so you see that I have a 2 pi here uh, in the uh, Poisson expression because uh, I don't have it there. And this is it. So the whole question in the rest of the talk is, can I explain, can I compare this um, individual uh, discrete particles dynamics to that limiting system? And there is a huge literature on the study of the, the keller zegel system, so I'm, again, not going to go into that. Um, I just want to briefly point out that um, if we compare it with a system that has the same singularity, which would be 2D Navier-Stokes in um, vorticity formulation, the big difference is 2D Navier-Stokes is Hamiltonian, and this is an attractive singular gradient flow. And so in particular, that can lead to concentrations. And we don't necessarily have global existence of uh, solutions for the system. It turns out that this particular system is simple enough that we have an exact criterion uh, to know when we have existence of global solutions or when we have a blow up. And it turns out that this does not depend on the initial data. Um, Notice that here, uh, rho bar is a probability distribution, so it automatically has total mass one, right? Um, 
That's because I get it as a mean field limit, so I get it as a limit of the one particle distribution. Um, so the strength of the interaction again is in lambda, which classically is, is uh, people take lambda equal one by rescaling rho bar. So the strength of the interaction is, is actually in the total mass. So I have a bit of a different formulation here again, due to the fact that I'm taking the mean field limit. So in that formulation, again, blow up does not depend at all on the initial data. It only depends on comparing lambda and sigma. And it turns out the criterion is whether lambda is less or equal than four sigma or strictly larger than four sigma. And this is again in dimension two. You could try to write a, a similar system in dimension three. If you keep the Poisson equation, then you have different blow ups. But if you keep not the Poisson equation, but this exact representation, so you keep the fact that C is given with a log, then it turns out that uh, L1 is still the critical space for uh, the, the, the equation. And you have very similar criterion for blow up, it, instead, except of four, instead of four, you have 2D showing up. All right, so this possibility of concentration is, of course, going to play a huge role in our analysis because that's the enemy, right? Um, the problem here is the singularity. So the problem is whenever one i, for one particle i, x i starts being close to x j. And this singularity is exactly what is going to blow up when you have concentrations. So the fact that the dynamics itself drives you towards it, that's going to be a major issue. So let me give a bit of an idea of how we are doing this. Um, so in some sense, this is an extension of, 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 of the previous result we had on 2D Navier Stokes with my student. And so what we are taking is a statistical approach to the problem. So what we are considering is the uh, joint blue of the positions at some time t. And, and here I just want to uh, emphasize this is the joint law. So this is not the whole information on the dynamics, right? In particular, this is not the law of the trajectories. Um, so some sort of correlations are lost when you're looking at, at uh, that object, correlations in times, for example. So if you had a particle at a given position at some time, um, you have no idea where it was before. Of course, the heart of the matter is to get something like propagation of chaos. So we're going to look at a solution to keller zegel at the limit. I'm going to call it rho bar. And try to compare this joint law with the tensorized object, which I, I'm denoting here rho bar n, right? And which is just this product of rho bar at, at every position. And the hope is that those two objects are going to be reasonably close, at least in the sense that their marginals are going to be close. And the marginals uh, are just, you know, the, the, so the marginal k is just the k particle distribution. So you can get it from the joint law by integrating through, um, with respect to the last n minus k variable, which is what you see here. And of course, the, the k marginal of rho bar n, right, is just uh, the, the tensorization k times of rho bar. So again, we want to find a way of comparing rho n and rho bar n that will give us a good estimate on the difference between those marginals. That's the goal here. And what we had done is we had used the Gibbs entropy um, as the right object to, to, uh, to lead to this comparison. And um, there are many reasons why the, the Gibbs entropy is the critical object here. Um, 
which are not necessarily connected directly to the dynamics. Um, actually, it's not a good object from the point of view of the dynamics, so uh, we'll have to correct it. But simply considering uh, a system of n particles, this has a lot of, of the right properties that you want. Uh, first of all, it's subadditive. And so what that means is if you control the relative entropy, the total relative entropy, right, this term Hn that I'm written here, then you also control the relative entropy with respect to any marginals. And you observe that I have the one other case, so it's, again, the right rescaling for the k marginals that is controlled by the right rescaling for the total joint law. So in particular, if I could prove that Hn was small, I would get strong convergence of any fixed marginal through a CSAR pullback uh, inequality. So a result like that. Except there's the square root, sorry. It's in that typo, but I forgot to correct it. The square root should go into the entropy as well. So uh, the L1 norm behaves like the square root of Hn. And the other key thing, of course, is that, that the relative entropy has the right scaling, right? So if I knew that rho n was tensorized, uh, for example, if I take it tensorized at the initial time, then this relative entropy Hn is just proportional to the relative entropy of, of the individual law. So it scales well, right? So it has every reason, for example, to be small at the initial time if I choose the, the, the if I choose the um, position xi0 as iid process. Now the use of relative entropy uh, is not entirely new uh, in the context of many particle systems, even though the way we are using it is, is relatively different. Uh, you actually have several earlier paper by Benavos when he's uh, and um, Zituni, and then also one with Tannenbaum, where they are actually using the relative entropy between trajectories, or some notion of relative entropy between trajectories, uh, which is a more complete relative entropy, but which I, I don't know how to handle, which is for this type of singular dynamics, which is really too bad for many reasons. And in fact, the, the, um, there are also some connections with random matrix theory I should mention, but the closest here is an older paper by Yao on the hydrodynamics of Gibbs bohr landau models. And here again, he has a system of particles is using the same relative entropy to compare with the limit. Um, the main difference is, is uh, the kind of estimates that he has to prove on it. All right, the big problem for keller zegel is the relative entropy is not well preserved by the dynamics. And this is because we have a gradient flow and we don't have a Hamiltonian system. So if I'm writing the Lugel equation, um, then L log L is not preserved and it might blow up. So what we had to do here is modify weight the uh, relative entropy. And the weight that we are using uh, are connected to the Gibbs equilibrium of the system. So you see that here, instead of having the integral of rho n log of rho n divided by rho n bar, I am rescaling rho n by the Gibbs equilibrium of the system, Gn, which I've written here. So starting from here, I have to assume that the interaction kernel K is a gradient flow, phi is the potential. And similarly, I have to rescale rho n bar by the equivalent of the mean field limit of rho n, which if you take a moment to, to think about is that object. And the first term here in the integral is probably reasonably obvious, right? I replace the discrete sum by a sum of the convolution. Um, there's actually a correction by a constant, which if you do a large deviation correctly, you see that you have to put. So I won't have time to explain, but just trust me on that one. 
Of course, G, Rho, and bar, right, is not independent of time now. It depends on Rho bar, and it's not an equilibrium for the limiting, uh, for the limiting equation. But it turns out that that particular object behave, now behaves well with respect to the dynamics. And the reason uh, for that is that this allows you to recover essentially a self adjoint structure on the Liouville equation once you have this rescaling. So let me present the, the result. So the main result here is we consider any even potential that are larger than the critical scaling for Keller's ego, the critical scaling in the sense, the scaling that gives you, that guarantees that you have global well causalness. So again, if I'm in dimension D and I have a log in the potential, this is uh, strength of the interaction is strictly less than 2D sigma. Now, there are a few other technical assumptions here, so you cannot just be satisfied with a lower bound on the potential. It needs to be here in some reasonable manner. Um, but Canada, for instance, will easily satisfy all, all those assumptions. You see that this would be enough, for instance, the last line here. And in that case, we have convergence. And we have convergence in a certain manner. So we have to assume that the relative entropy is initially small. And we have to assume that this weighted relative entropy is small as well. And let me observe here that EN doesn't necessarily have a sign because this is no more a relative entropy between probability measure. There is no particular reason why uh, the integral of rho n divided by g n should be equal to the integral of rho n bar divided by g rho bar n, for example. Um, so this is why you find the absolute value here. E n could be um, slightly negative, for example. But if both are small, then they remain small up to a polynomial correction in n, and this just comes from the fact that there is a law of large number hiding somewhere in the, in the analysis. And in particular, that gives you what you want. So if you choose them, polynomially small in n, right, then you could even choose them equal to zero if initially everything is, uh, so hn zero could be zero, for example, if initially the, the, the particles are iid with the right law then you get explicit polynomial rate of convergence on any marginals in strong norm in L1. So that's our result. And I am running out of time, so I just want to point out a few key things here. First of all, I can split this energy EN into the relative entropy, right, which is our relative entropy, and an additional term, which um, has this ratio of the real Gibbs versus, uh, divided by mean field Gibbs. This is actually the expectation of the modulated potential energy that Serfati is using. And so one way of seeing EN is as a modulated free energy for the system. So again, this is what gives you self-adjoint structure um, on, on the Liouville equation. And you could, you could not propagate the relative entropy, but now we have very simple algebraic expression to propagate En, which uh, I'm writing here. And you see that there is a dissipation term, which is essentially a feature information term with the right uh, weight and scaling. And there is this remainder, which is where we are going to have to do some um, low of large number. And it actually turns out that handling the right-hand side is not easy, but straightforward because it corresponds to things that we knew how to do already. 
And it's a combination of what we did for 2D Navier Stokes and what Serfati did. So there is nothing really new in how to handle the right hand side. The big issue here is that EN might not have a side. And so the big new technical improvement in the system is a new type of large deviation inequality that applies to similar potential. And again, uh, I don't want to take too much time, so um, let me not talk too much about that. I just want to mention that this is actually directly connected to the, the logarithmic Harvey Little Wood Sobolev inequality, which is the key um, inequality to get global existence to Keller Zegel in dimension two. And in some sense, this is a, um, an extension to many particles of this uh, logarithmic inequality. And I am now going to conclude, so I hope I was not too fast. Um, so the big point here is uh, you have to use the right physics, the physics that is adapted to the system. And that is what leads to this modulated um, free energy, this EN. Uh, that is at the heart of the whole method. And then it works well. Uh, you get a statistical control. Again, I don't have a control of the trajectories here, so they could be crazy. Uh, it works with relatively broad assumptions, so that probably should be able to encompass a large class of, of systems. And you get explicit rates of convergence. Now, for 2D Navier Stokes, uh, we knew they were optimal. Um, I have no idea uh, how optimal they are in that case. But of course, there are many other systems that, that are not considered here. And for example, it would be very interesting to have an idea of what's happening if you're neither Hamiltonian nor a gradient flow. And I don't know how to do that uh, right now. It was already too long, so thank you so much. Maybe I can start with the first question. So you said systems with different structure, non-Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. non-gradient flow. So do you think we should be able to do something for combination of that? Or? I, I think I would like to. Uh, whether it's possible or not, I mean, I don't know how to do it. But uh, the, 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 the question here is, of course, that the Sorry, this is pretty much built around the gradient flow structure. And, and if I have a Hamiltonian, right, I'm, I'm just going to use with the, use the relative entropy. And, uh, and if I have something which is not divergence free, but that is not a gradient flow, I have no idea which quantity to use. And, and I think that's a very natural question. Again, I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, I, I have a, another question. At some point, you said potentially it's an even function. Mm -hmm. do, do you have uh, other so, so there are no, there are problems that the potential is not an even function. Um, there are actually problems in a sense uh, in, in the, the self-interaction. So the, the, uh, if, if the potential is not even, right, this is where I, where I put it. Um, let me show you this one. Right, so, so this is an even potential. What, what you see here is that when uh, when j, uh, so this is now on, right? And so when j is getting close to i, uh, you have a can an exact cancellation between the force applied to, applied to one, uh, applied from i to j, and the force applied to j to on, on y, right? Yeah. And if you lose that, I'm a little bit at a loss what to do in some cases. So this is where this, this assumption comes from. 
Yeah, so the question, can you replace this symmetry by some other classes of symmetry? So could be. Uh, so the thing that I really need is that K be odd, right? And if K is not odd, I, I, there are problems. So there are really problems. That seems actually relatively fundamental as an assumption so far.